Mr. President, since we first began consideration of the FDA bill, I have stood on this floor again and again to highlight the importance of an amendment I offer to this legislation that is very significant to my fellow West Virginians and all Americans. This amendment would put tighter controls on drugs containing a substance known as hydrocodone, a highly addictive prescription painkiller that is destroying communities across this country and leaving families devastated by abuse and addiction. It was a proud moment for me when the Senate came together across party lines on May 23rd and unanimously adopted my amendment to reclassify hydrocodone as a Schedule II substance from a Schedule III. In practical terms, this means that those who are using hydrocodone for illegitimate reasons would have a harder time getting their hands on it. I cannot tell you how much this amendment means to the people of West Virginia and to every law enforcement group fighting the war on drugs across this nation who believe very strongly that limiting access to hydrocodone would give them a powerful tool in combating prescription drug abuse. So it pains me to stand here today following last night's vote to move forward with the passage of the FDA bill, which did not contain this such, such important amendment. Mr. President, uh, that is because the influence of special interest groups suppressed the voices of the people not just in my state of West Virginia, but in yours in Delaware and all across this country, who are begging us to do something about the prescription drug abuse epidemic. According to the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, prescription drug abuse is the fastest growing drug problem in the United States, and it's claiming the lives of thousands of Americans every year. Prescription drugs are responsible for about 75% of all drug-related deaths in the United States and 90% in West Virginia. These narcotic painkillers claim the lives of more Americans than heroin and cocaine combined. But the groups opposed to my amendment have a huge financial stake in keeping these pills as accessible as possible, and I understand that. And that is why my amendment was stripped from the FDA bill that we advanced last night. Mr. President, high-powered and well-funded lobbyists may have gotten their victory this time around, but I can assure you I will not give up this fight, as I know many of my colleagues won't either. I'm hearing on a daily basis from my constituents in West Virginia and all around this country who are counting on us, their elected representatives, to do something about the prescription drug epidemic ravaging their communities. Since I offered this amendment, I have heard from so many West Virginians who have seen a ray of hope because we might be able to do something about this problem. I won't pretend that it'll solve it completely, but it is sure a good step in the right direction. So, Mr. President, I'm coming to the floor to share the stories of the people of West Virginia in the hopes of bringing people together around a solution to this terrible, terrible problem. Here's a letter from Sheila from Charleston, who sent me this letter and supported my amendment after losing a close family member. Sheila writes, please continue to fight the drug companies and pharmacies regarding this issue. Our family in the last two months lost a beloved family member to prescription drug overdose. He was a promising young man that lost his life because of addiction to pain medication. Our family continues to be devastated, wondering how did this happen? He came from a highly educated family that was involved in his treatment, and we cared deeply for him. His family spent over $100,000 in his recovery, but it was all too easy for him to obtain legal prescriptions. What truly makes it more painful is he was showing signs of overcoming his five-year battle. Now, we are not blaming anyone but the system. We know we are each responsible for our own actions. I have thought for years that our health care system is far behind in technology and record-keeping for doctor shopping and prescription dispensing. Please understand I am very much opposed to more government in our personal lives. However, this is much needed in the medical arena. Please continue to fight this enormous battle for all of us. Mr. President, that letter could have come from your constituents, my constituents, any congressman's home district, from anywhere in this great country. The fact is, I don't know a person, whether it be us in the Senate, our colleagues in the Congress, or anywhere in America, that someone hasn't been affected by this abuse of legal prescription drugs used in the wrong manner. It touches everyone's life. It's of epidemic proportion. I've said it before, and I will say it again. I understand that limiting access to illegitimate uses of hydrocodone pills doesn't necessarily fit in the business plan or the model of selling more product. 
But there are times when even the best business plan can be altered while staying successful. And certainly one of those times is when the health of our country and the public good is at stake. In fact, the Huntington Herald Dispatch, the second largest newspaper in my state, located right on the border between West Virginia and Ohio, describes why this amendment is so important. Congress is missing out on an opportunity to close the spigot at least partway on the large volumes of commonly abused prescription drugs that flood the country and harm so many Americans. Mr. President, in 2010, the most recent year for which data is available, a study showed that there was 28,310 recorded instances of toxic exposure from hydrocodone. The same study showed that 24 million individuals have admitted to abusing hydrocodone drugs for non-medical purposes. Unbelievable. A different study put out by the Centers of Disease Control in November showed that more than 40 people die every day from overdoses involving narcotic pain relievers like hydrocodone. Isn't it worth doing something to get the pills out of the wrong hands? My amendment may not have gone into this bill yesterday, but it's not going to go away. I think we all know that. And I'm determined to see this thing through to the end. Mr. President, while the people of West Virginia and I know in Delaware are disappointed in the outcome of the hydrocodone amendment, I do, I do want to highlight one measure that was included in the legislation that we're both proud about. Uh, it's important to me and you and everybody in this body. It would make the sale and distribution of synthetic marijuana and other synthetic substances, which are known as bath salts, illegal by placing them on the list of a Schedule I controlled substance under the Controlled Substance Act. These drugs are also taking a terrible toll on all of our states. And I was proud to co-sponsor this provision with my uh, friend, Senator Schumer. I want to thank Senator Schumer for his leadership in getting this provision passed. Finally, I want to close with one more story from my home state of West Virginia as a way to remind you of what I'm fighting for and why. This letter comes from Rebecca, a woman who started a group called Mothers Against Prescription Drug Abuse as a way to deal with the terrible realities that have accompanied her son's five-year battle with prescription drug abuse. Give me that water break, Dad. Jamie was a great kid growing up. He played basketball, football, and baseball. When he was 14 years old, his team won the state tournament and went all the way to Wisconsin to play in the regionals. Jamie was always helping others and had such a kind heart. When Jamie got out of school, he married his high school sweetheart and was employed in the mines. After that, he just went downhill. He began abusing prescription drugs. For two years, I tried everything to get help for him and tried to get him to stop. Things only got worse. He lost his wife, he lost his home, his truck, and then his freedom. My story is typical to so many families out there who are struggling with loved ones that are addicted. They just want someone to listen. They need to be able to reach out to someone who understands the nightmare that they go through daily and know that they are not alone. The addict is not the only one who suffers. The family members carry around guilt, sadness, shame, anger, hopelessness, fear, anxiety, and etc. I could go on and on about how bad this experience has been for me and how it has not stopped. I will continue to fight prescription drug abuse for as long as I have a breath in my body. I will not give up on my son or anyone else who is addicted. The things need to change within our system. We cannot continue to allow just anyone to have access to prescription pain medicine. Parents need to be educated while their children are still at home. Communities need to be aware of crimes, drug dealers, and report them. Doctors need to stop prescribing pain pills to people on the street and they need to be held accountable. What happened to our medical ethics when people who need pain medicine for a while are given strong addictive pain medicine, only to have to keep coming back to the doctor over and over again for refills? Is it greed that is behind the beginning of this growing epidemic? Doctors definitely profit from the addicts' return visits as well as the pharmaceutical companies that make the medicine. We know there is a problem, but what are people going to do about it? I'm doing what I can, but it is not enough. Will you all please help me? For Rebecca and all the other mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers out there who are help, pleading for help, we owe it to them, Mr. President. 
to get this amendment passed.